Thanks for joining us on IAEE TV, produced by CNTV. Our team captured this interactive session titled "Developing an Attendee Relations Program That Nets Real Results While at Expo Expo." You'll hear questions from the audience throughout the session that will provide you with key information to enhance your attendee experience. I'm the president of MDG, and those of you who aren't familiar with the agency, we specialize in um, marketing and PR for trade shows and conferences. We've been around for 38 years, but I would say in the last five to six, our emphasis has really changed and the mix of tactics that we're using have changed a lot. We're doing so much digitally now with um, digital uh, campaigns, SEM, triggered email campaigns, um, paid search, um, you know, so many new things retargeting, but with everything that we're doing that's so technologically advanced, we're also finding that the face-to-face -face connection is becoming increasingly important in our efforts to generate audience. So that's really what the focus of our session is gonna be about today, um, kind of on the other end of the technology spectrum and how to plan and implement and execute uh, an attendee relations campaign. And, I think there's probably a lot of different ways we refer to it in the room, whether it's uh, community relations, buyer relations, VIP audience acquisition, but we're, we're sort of all gonna be talking about the same thing, um, utilizing a personal touch to build audience. And I'd like to introduce you to my panelists, and I'll start with uh, Camille Candela, who's the VP of Marketing at Emerald Exhibitions. And, um, she is a woman who has always been ahead of her time in marketing trends. When I first started working with Camille, she was at Magic about uh, 12 or 13 years ago and um, was responsible for really building a very robust buyer relations program there. So. Hi, I'm Camille. Um, I started my career um, in the industry about 14 years ago with Advanced Star. At the time, I had 13 shows in the women's fashion industry a year, so you can imagine that's one every month, and they were very large in New York and Las Vegas. So what I spent time, my time doing at that point was emails and direct mail because there wasn't much time for anything else. Um, but it was really our CEO at the time that kind of championed the, the thought process that you know we as trade shows spend so much time. We have a sales team for exhibitors and vendors. Why don't we have a sales team on the attendee side? Because at the end of the day, that's what our job is, is to bring the attendee to the exhibitor. That's what they pay us for. So. Um, our, our kind of first four way into that at Magic, we had two buyer relations, we called them buyer relations um, team members, and by the time I left, we were at 15. And I can't tell you just to hear, and like I said, I was, I was the marketing director, but marketing and attendee relations, and, and we separated the team, worked hand in hand um, across the board about how we were gonna approach you know, the market. And we would hear stories from the road, and literally they would be road warriors out on the road. And for stores and retailers to be, they'll be like, wow, like Magic walked in my store. I'm a little bitty store in Cleveland, Ohio, but somebody from the show that's the biggest in our industry came to see me. And so it, it was really interesting. Um, and now that I'm at Emerald, I've been here about three years. Um, you know, attendees always been really important, but this, we don't have a, a buyer relations team that is robust as when I left Magic at, well, at 15, but it has become increasingly important. Um, so it is on the top of minds um, in our senior leaders at our, our business. So it's something that we're paying a lot of attention to. And our second panelist is Kim Corey from World Pet Association. And um, I often attend their show called Super Zoo for independent pet retailers. And I'll do on-site qualitative research and I'll ask the buyers who are there, what made you decide to choose this, this event? There's uh, you know competitors in the industry and they often say, the people from SuperZoo are so invested in my success. They really care about us and want us to do well. And I think a lot of that is because of the efforts of, of Kim and her team. Yep. And I actually started in this industry on the other side of the trade show as an exhibitor for 14 years with a publishing company who did publish into the pet and uh, livestock industry. So I'm familiar with the pet world. Two years ago, uh, World Pet Association took on the initiative to not only sales or have sales folks out there driving attend exhibitors, but the attendee side. So we're a relatively new program, but so far it's proved very successful and glad to be here. Good, we're glad to have you. 
And um, our final panelist is very near and dear to my heart because she is uh, one of the senior account strategists at MDG out of the DC office and is overseeing a team of attendee um, marketing specialists. I've been working with some attendee marketing programs like this for the last couple of years, both as in-house you know, marketing director and now with MDG uh, with several of our clients. And we've seen a lot of success with programs um, that focus specifically on some events that are newer in their infancy and looking to build their brand reputation, as well as events that really focus on networking and, and having that, that close connection. So we talked a little bit you know, in today's media landscape with um, so many technological innovations enabling us to reach our attendees more efficiently and effectively. Why do you think buyer relations programs are gaining so much traction and importance, which is sort of the opposite of efficient and effective, if you think about it? I want to know how many people in here have over a thousand emails in their inbox right now. <laughs> I do. Okay, so we all know conferences. Uh, conference calls, emails, texting, social media, all of these things are very critical and they're very important and they have changed the landscape of the way that we communicate you know, with, with, with our audiences. Um, but building and maintaining business relationships, nothing has the impact like face-to-face -face or knowing someone. So I kind of approach it or think that while all these things are great and, and they're going to continue to have a space in what we do in the future, at the end of the day, people buy from people, right? You know, connecting with people is so important. So I think that's why we're starting to see that. And in our industry, like I said before, has spent so much time, you know, everything is on the vendor side. You know, we think of all the systems and all the things that we do on the, on the exhibitor side, and then go and think about what you've done on the attendee side. And it's just lacking. And when you think about it, and everybody will say this, the number one most important thing in our business is the attendee. That's how I approach it. I mean, I, I did not come from the industry. I've been in it for 14 years, but it was ingrained in my head as a marketing person, attendee, 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 and that's where I spend my time. So that's how I feel as a person, that when I know someone and, and meet them face to face, it's so much more powerful. Um, all the other things are important, but it's so much more powerful. So I think that's why people are realizing with all the clutter that's out there, and, and there's so much information, and when people need something, they have multitudes of ways of finding it, but having that face to face connection and, and, and connecting with a real person, um, it's still really important. Right. Would you have anything to add to that? Kim? Yeah, um, we're finding the same situation that Camille's company is in that the retail stores are thrilled when we walk through the door. But in the past, we could sort of rely on the exhibitors from our company who would have sales reps going into these retail stores. And when it was almost time for the trade show, they would say, oh, you know, make sure you come see us, da, da, da. Well, they're not sending the sales reps into the stores as often as they were. They might hit an A store, but you know, there's, a, there's a lot of other stores out there, retailers that we want to come to our store, our, our trade show. They don't have always time to read the trade magazines. They don't have time to go through all of, all of the emails that come through. So that, again, that personal one-on-one -on -one that we care enough to stop into their store is, is great. What kinds of things are, are you doing, Kim, to involve exhibitors in your attendee relations programs or to at least let them know what you're doing in terms of attracting buyers to see them at the, right. the show? We have a, what's called a Partners in Promotion program, so whereby our exhibitors can't necessarily get into all of the stores to promote their presence at our show. They can send out, um, they can send out emails. They can put banner ads on their websites. They can post on Facebook. We're going to be at SuperZoo. Be sure to visit our booth. Um, so we do put some of the onus onto them to help draw their customers into the show. And I know, Shauna, we're, we're using the Partners in Promotion programs as well and, and taking even a personalized approach and getting the exhibitors to use that, those tools. Right. So maybe we, we often have our VIP program specialist and, and that team calling the exhibitors individually and talking to them about what we're doing to get the right people there into their booth, but then talking to them about how we can help them um, expand upon that. And we do offer you know, those tools like social media posts and suggested things like that, but we'll even go as far as customizing it specifically to the exhibitor because when we give it to them on a platter, we see that they tend to use it a, right. a lot more. Mm -hmm. And I want to mention, and we talked about this earlier when we were meeting, um, I, th I don't think you can stress Everybody, we do surveys, right? We ask our customers, mm -hmm. you know, how's it going? What do you like about our trade show? But there's nothing when our team is on the phone or, or in front of someone you can tell. The, the 
intel and the research that you can do face to face mm -hmm. is so mm -hmm. incredibly different than sending out a survey where pe that people fill out. Um, being able to talk to your customers and really find out what's going on in their lives and their business and what concerns them, you know, can help shape your shape your 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 trade show and your event. And we do that a lot on the exhibitor side, but for the most part, n nobody's doing it super well right. on the attendee side. Mm -hmm. I mean. You probably find that when you're on the road. Right, we get feedback about our show. You know, we would like to see this done a little bit differently, or you know, mm -hmm. could we have this? And, and they'll open up more, right? Than just a standard, you know, select on a radio button off a survey. Right. The first audience question is, how do you get face-to-face -face meetings with executives? One thing that we've been doing with some of our events is we've been holding what we're calling influencer meetings, um, and we usually do them over a meal. So often it's influencer breakfast. Um, where we invite those high level, those executive level folks, you know, in small groups of 10 or so to, you know, get together and network. And it's an opportunity for them to meet with their peers who they don't necessarily get to see all the time. But it's also an opportunity for us to have that two-way conversation to ask the questions that are keeping them up at night and how we can shape the event for them. Um, and then they also see the opportunities that they would have in coming to the event and getting even more of that networking. We often find that they'll then want to send some of their staff along as well to, you know, get that, that opportunity. And one of the things that we do is, is having to do them in different regions to try and get it so that they are more convenient for people. So, you know, look for areas where we can pull a, a decent number of people together in one, in one space and then sometimes have to do several of them across a region. Yeah, so with the hospital executives, we chose major markets, uh, D.C., New York, and a couple others and invited the, um, the senior level people to have breakfast at, you know, the Four Seasons. It's always a place that's nice. It was hosted by an editor of a publication. They're small, but in addition to getting the really great market feedback, you're also, you are creating a community of influencers, of, of people in a tight-knit community that talk to their peers and that will go mm -hmm. out there and be evangelists for your brand because you've taken, you care enough about them to ask their opinion and get their feedback and get their buy-in that's going to help shape the content of their event. So because they're feeling a little piece of ownership, they're more excited about talking to other people within in their network. So. It is, I mean, it's difficult to scale, but that helps somewhat with the scalability when you're creating people that are out there in market evangelizing. Good. Um, so Shauna and Camille, you are both sort of overseeing attendee relations programs, and there's a few people out here who said they were thinking about starting one or would like to get one started. What advice would you give them for, um, what types of people to hire or what to look for in the hiring process? Um, I would say, and I really like to go looking at your industry, the number one, one in two per people are a buyer that's in your industry that knows your industry because they understand the day-to-day -day that goes on in a buyer's life and what they're going to be faced with. And we have to remember at the end of the day, too, this is not something that you take a marketing coordinator and you just let them do it. I view this as it's a sales position. You're selling people on coming to your event. They've got to be out of their store or away from their business. And while it might be free to get to your event, or maybe it, there is a cost, so it is, it's a sales job, and I, I kind of view it as a sales job, um, or a rep from your industry. So someone like you, you were at the exhibit, and you were an exhibitor, right. so you understand calling on mm -hmm. a customer. Um, and a good example in one of our trade shows is called Couture, and it's um, high-end jewelry trade show. Um, everything from David Yerman to Cartier, and we hired the lady from the little blue box, so Tiffany's. She was the Tiffany's rep for 15 years. So you can imagine the brand recognition and power that Tiffany's has with an independent jewelry retailer. She knew every single person. When you walk in the door, Jan walked in our company with a list of clientele that we couldn't buy or make those relationships for anything. So she was the perfect person. So she is our attendee relations person on our, on our couture show. And she, to this day, is friends with these people, has relationships with these people, so she was a perfect hire for us. Mm -hmm. Right. Diane? Yeah, when we're looking for people on our team, we're, we're looking for people who are strategic thinkers. We're looking for people who have a lot of poise in unfamiliar um, situations. You know, obviously, we work with a lot of different clients, and so we have to very quickly become experts in their industry. So we don't always have the luxury of getting somebody who's been in that market, but we want somebody who's going to be able to speak on a peer level. I and mean, we are often speaking to executives, so we want somebody who will be taken seriously, who can ask intelligent questions can easily see synergies between conversations they've had with in one place and another so that they can pull all of that information together and speak intelligently um, in that marketplace. And as somebody who's actually out in the field doing it, Kim, would you agree with that? Or? I would, and it's also really important that the person that's on the road touching the stores, the, in our case, the pet stores, has a professional and 
hopefully a personal mm. background in that. I used to own a boarding kennel. So I can go into a grooming shop and talk shop. Mm. Um, and they also have to be a road warrior. Yeah. We're, we're on the road more than we're not. Right. So. Right, how many days a month? I, some days I'm only home 10 days a month. Oftentimes we're asked to, to present on panels like this because we're doing a lot of things right and we have successful shows mm -hmm. and the programs are successful, but maybe give me an example of when an attendee relation program didn't work or something specific that you tried that, that perhaps didn't work. Camille? Um, I, I think the one, and my team will laugh at this one, that, um, we, we wanted, we, our largest show is 45,000 attendees. And when I came on board, we've got this massive amounts of data. Um, our largest show is really like nine shows in one. And I know a lot of trade shows say that, but we really are. We have everything from a tobacco store to a gift store. You can find a, a hookah or a bong on the floor, and you can find a lawnmower, and you can find jewelry. So it really runs the gamut. I don't know if you've ever heard of ASD, but that, that's our show. So the we wanted to figure out a way we could connect with first-time exhibitor uh, attendees, and we had a lot of them. So we couldn't send our team out on the road, and it was a lot of calls to make. So we decided to do an event on site. And we did a first time timers event as a cocktail hour. We thought that that would be a way for our team to be in the room and interact with them like you would be in their store. Um, what we found because our audience is so varied um, is that you're in a room talking to people has so many different levels. So it's really important to segment you know, the market because the conversations you were having with one in a circle and them commiserating was completely different because of their businesses. So I would say that um, like, you, like Shauna was talking about the influencer events, you've got like-minded people in the room. Mm -hmm. And so that was our mistake, because it was just like, oh, this is just like a disaster, because no, it wasn't connecting or meshing the way it should at all. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we tried uh, with a launch event to incentivize the exhibitors to use a unique code to invite their list. And that's something that we've had a lot of success with for a lot of events. But in this particular instance, we, didn't, we did a lot of work on the back end to set all of it up and really didn't have the time to fully explain to the exhibitor community what it was all about, what we were doing, and how it was going to benefit them. So we really didn't see the incentive work. And at the end of the day, we put in a lot of hours and didn't see a lot of results from it. And so I think it, for us, it was a good lesson in really making sure we tailor exactly to the audience as you're talking about customization. That's key with these kinds of programs and really making sure you have the time to get it out there and into the space and make sure everyone understands what it's all about so that you'll see the benefit on the end. And just to add to that, we um, I, I worked on an attendee relations initiative as well that um, wasn't as successful as we'd hoped. We partnered with um, key associations that served the industry. It was a, an event put on by the media and we spent so much time, we invested so much in, you know, in, invite your um, attendee base and, and again here are the codes and we created customized ads for their publications and their newsletters. We did so much and uh, we got a very small return on the investment and when we started talking to the heads of the associations and, and really digging into it we found that they weren't very invested in the event to begin with. So they sort of felt used um, that we were utilizing them primarily to generate audience, but we weren't also asking about direction for the event. And, and I think that that's one of the reasons why we've started approaching it more with these influencer type meetings so that we're getting buy-in at that level and we're helping people to feel invested so that they then will go out and um, you know do some of our, our message spreading for And I can us. speak to a little bit. We had a success story on getting them invested because I've done it so, for instance, if you decide you want to host, right, you know, uh, everybody would like to have a lot of money to host buyers, and some shows do it and some shows don't. So I've done it where we just kind of rely on putting it out there, um, hope our exhibitors become invested. A lot of times they don't. So I kind of did a test on a, on a jewelry show that we did and met a great salesperson. And we're, we're at their booth. We're talking to them. They're like, you guys got to get more South American buyers to the show. And, and, and they're like, we're down there all the time, and we see all these stores that don't come. And so I was like, all right, well, I want to help, we'll help each other, right? You've got your rep down there, so you're already paying for them to go down there. Their, their flights, their hotels, everything, you're in front of the customers. So we're going to co-brand a hosting program, and we're going to pick a certain amount, and you're going to invite those people to come to the show. So they look like the hero. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they went off the charts. They, they invited tw 20 buyers from Brazil. Those buyers alone 
wrote $100,000 in orders. I mean, just from that one exhibitor, not counting the other ones that we got feedback on the floor that had seen those new Brazilian buyers. So if you've got an enthusiastic exhibitor, and I was all about it, your name can be on everything. We did a, a nice uh, presentation and a flyer, and it's like, okay, here's a program. I want you to be involved in it. We're going to host you. And it had their name on it along with ours. And so they were really invested because they knew that that buyer was going to come to their booth. Right. Yeah. Sean, how have you gotten um, sponsors or exhibitors involved in, in your attendee relations? Um, well, so one of the things, and, and going back to the influencer meetings, that's another way that we've gotten some of our sponsors involved is giving them an opportunity to have a seat at the table. Um, we had done an event in healthcare where they, the you know, hospital executives worked really closely with the vendors, and so giving them the opportunity to sit together at the table uh, was, was a really good opportunity for them, and it was something that they then wanted to you know, promote and be a part of. Good. So um, Camille and Kim both have um, retail shows, mm -hmm. so when they're expending all of this effort to get buyers to the show floor, it's potentially, you know, millions of dollars of open to spend mm -hmm. money. So Shauna, why do you think an attendee relation program is, um, you know, would still make sense for a non-retail show where the buyers aren't coming with millions of dollars to invest back into your exhibitor. Well, as I mentioned, we do it a lot with shows that are a little newer and more in their infancy, and especially for shows like that, it's really important to have this you know, great uh, group of people who are, are high-profile attendees who are part of your event from the beginning. It's going to help you build that you know, brand from the bottom up, and so being able to get them invested right up at front is really important. Um, so you want to have them there, even if it's not all about buying and spending. Um, you know the other the other opportunity that you have in getting getting all those people there when you have an event that's focused on networking and thought leadership you want the thought leaders there from the beginning so those conversations start and it just builds the brand profile from the very beginning I, I'm also curious about how you measure the success of these programs in order to demonstrate ROI either to ensure that your funding doesn't get cut or to, to try to get more funding for this program so I'll start I'm the data Nazi <laughs> <laughs> data Nazi, my whole team knows it. Um, being in marketing and our CMO, it, it's about the data, so we, we always want to try to prove it. Um, so I don't know how every single thing, every effort that we do in the attendee relations department, we try, try, try. And I would say to this point, and it is small, and we're, we're just starting out, our, our team is uh, like four people, and then we have some extended, extended group, but um, every single thing is tied back to the database. So every call they make has a pearl for that particular person that comes out of the database. So if the end result is to meet in a registration, it's tied completely back so I can know how many people registered and then how many people verified on site. Um, that way, among my staff, I can tell which staff person is having a higher verified rate than, than the others. Um, if it's a trip, we can even we can do that when they make calls. I will say the one thing that's kind of um, falling down with us, and I'd love to know from you guys, you know, we spend so much time uh, on the exhibitor side, and we keep talking about that. You know, there's a CRM system, and uh, everybody has one. It's Gold Mine, Salesforce, Unger Box, Sugar, whatever it is. And we capture data, and we keep all this great data on the exhibitor side. And I have data on the attendee side for registration, but how many people use a CRM on the attendee side? Say so like one. I mean, and, and you guys use one. We were talking earlier, right. and you guys use one, and and we have one too. But everything's offline. It's in Excel spreadsheets, you know that sort of thing with regards to you know what's going on. Tomorrow, you're going to win the lottery, and you're going to run away to the Bahamas, and then the next person coming in is not going to know like what conversations <laughs> had been had with that customer or what their thoughts were. And so you know, I know for us, that's we're starting to have those conversations. You know, with the people that do our CRM on our uh, exhibitor side, how do we connect that to our database and, and, and with registration so that we have a full view on the attendee side as we do on the exhibitor side. So we have Vinny Polito, the Pinnacle Award winner in the audience today. So do you have any words of wisdom? I did it a lot when I was at Reed um, calling on cancer practices. And you know, it's kind of a feel awkward walking into a place where there's a waiting room of people, you know, waiting for treatment. Um, but like, Super Zoo and, and Camille have said the impression that they were getting was just incredible that that um, we can make a difference and we're going out there to help them and our pitch was when I was at Reed was the next patient you see will benefit by the event you were at mm -hmm. um, so we were less definitely less about this is an event and more about 
we're going to help you professionally. And um, solutions. You know, I, mm -hmm. I probably called on a hundred cancer practices, um, and then Reed being as big as it was, and any of the big producers, what would then happen is I might be, I'm going to Minnesota, right? Not in the winter, but I'm going to Minnesota, and they'd be okay. JCK or a jewelry show would say, while you're there, can you call on a jewelry show? So. Mm -hmm. The juxtaposition for a big company would be, you know, your cancer practice to a jewelry jewelry store was a bit <laughs> odd, but um, didn't you say you like in the same day you would meet with jewelry stores and absolutely hospitals yeah, um, but it, the it, what came tr through a lot was simply that you're taking the time to invest to come see me. Um, it made a big difference, and mm -hmm. I realize you're a little younger than me. Um, the biggest thing that that I also found was if you had somebody who just was hoping. If I do well here, I can get to booth sales. They're the wrong person. Mm -hmm. You have to have that person who is like, I want to be in industry relations. I want, you know, this is so I'm less wired about that. You know, let me jump to booth sales because I can make two percent on a booth, and more in I want to drive, you know, the, the value of what we're doing. And you can incentivize them, you know, on um, finding new. Um, targets to put in the database, mm -hmm. as well as you know meeting certain goals of how many people they they meet. Um, once we start getting really strong um, data on, you know, who's pushing through, you know, verified, and we can tie those numbers together, so, but that's what you want to do. Right. Asking questions where you can then explain how the benefits of your show are going to meet their specific needs. It's something that's not going to happen in an email or, or something like that. Right. right. So, I don't know, maybe, um, Kim, do you have any examples of when you were talking to a buyer, you were in a store where they shared something with you about their business or their challenges or opportunities where you were able to kind of craft a message about why your show made sense? I was. Uh, a large component of our show is the educational por portion of it. And we tailor the classes to not only the store owners on a management level, but we have classes all the way right down to um, not a stock shelfer, but all levels of the company. So it's an opportunity for them to have a different level of education for their employees. Mm -hmm. So even if it's not the owner that goes to the show, they could send a manager or two managers or someone mm -hmm. that's climbing the ladder at the store, send them out to the show for the education. Mm -hmm. So yes. Just by the fact that we're at a regional trade show and we've got these buyers walking up and down the aisle, we've already pre-qualified them. They get trade shows. Mm -hmm. They understand the importance mm -hmm. of it. I walk into a C retail store. Some of them don't care anymore. They don't go to regional shows. So right off the bat, you know, I won't go back there next year. Mm -hmm. But if I keep seeing the same people at a regional show, I'm, I'll go into their store yeah. and have, you know, if I, I got a three second conversation at the show, I'm going into the store for a 20 minute conversation next time. So you've mentioned a few times you've referred to them as like A stores, B stores, C stores. How do you classify them? And then it sounds like you are visiting some C stores. Why are you going to the stores that aren't uh -huh. just the A stores? So, yeah, so the A stores are the ones that are absolutely beautiful. You walk in, you know instantly that they attend trade shows and they, they have the newest and greatest in their stores. Um, and the C stores, that's not always on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> it's that sometimes you you know, yeah. oops. But. And how do you how do you plan your schedule? You're a road warrior, you said. Like mm -hmm. how do you plan a day? How you're going to spend it? How you get yeah. around? Tell us about some of the details and logistics. Right. So in um, February, I have a show, a, tri a regional distributor show in Wisconsin. So I'll fly in the week before the show starts and just hit stores. I'll take our database, uh, anyone that's just in our mail system already or they've attended our show before, and I'll just, and I'll go on to Yelp too, and I'll look on for Yelp reviews and just do a Google map, hit all the stores, and then I may see them at the show the next week or I may not, but just in case I don't, I will have already walked into their store and talked to them. And do you call them first and let them know you're coming? I don't. No. Uh, because my map says to do this loop, and if this guy says come in at 10 o'clock, but I'm up here at 9, mm -hmm. I just cold call, you just walk right in. And if I've got a stretch where I don't have any regional shows to do, to do I'll just go into Atlanta, Georgia, for two weeks and just. Yeah. And how do you, do you have any sort of uh, formal follow-up with them or anything that you do after? 
an email saying, thank you for taking time to see me, if you have any questions, and then depending on which show it is we're promoting or how close it is to that particular show, if registration's already open, I'll, you know, so yeah, I'll fine tune it to whatever mm -hmm. the timing is. Right. How about you, Camille? Is there any sort of system to what you do, the way that you decide who you're going to call, how you prioritize it, what the steps are in the process? Uh, it, it's definitely hard at our large show because, like I said, it's 50,000 attendees each show and then no retention, so there's a lot in and out. So th it's been a little bit of a beast to kind of tackle it. But when you were mentioning earlier, you talked about an A, B, and C store. When I said Advanced Star, we had the same tiering structure on the attendee side as the exhibitor side. And we started tiering back in 2003, and it literally is a constant um, upkeep and maintenance. But we would tier A, B, C, D. And, and that tiering level, once we tiered, would um, we would assign, like, okay, a, a, an A tier exhibitor or otherwise needs to be visited twice a year, a B tier maybe one visit a year, a phone call, you know, so we would set a set of criteria based on their tier. And to mention, we kind of went off like the publication tiering, you know, if somebody buys six or more pages of advertising, that's how they say you're an A tier. So you could be, you know, not necessarily a great brand, but you buy a lot of advertising or you do a lot of, you know, mm. participation in another trade show. Same thing on the attendee side. It attends a lot of trade shows. You could be an A tier, might not be the best brand, or you're a key influencer. But then you've got the people like in the fashion industry, Donna Karen's brand is never going to come to Magic. She doesn't need to come to Magic. She's not going to come. So she might be a C, even though she's a true industry leader and influencer. You know, so we're going to use, utilize her brand in a different way, right? right? Mm -hmm. Maybe in an influencer breakfast like, like that. Mm -hmm. So um, it's all about setting that criteria. And so that's how we base, decide you know, who gets touched. Um, but I think... You know what she mentioned about going to the larger cities, and and when we had the 15 at Advanced Star. It was literally like go to the cities, and we would use like Wear magazine, and it depends on what your what your market is, but we could use Wear because it was retail based, and see like what was going on. It always knew, especially when anything new was coming up, um, and getting inside their store. So we'd go little, large to small if we were in a, in a city as much as we could. Another audience question is: Once you have an attendee that you visited on site at the show, what do you do with them? Do you provide them with special treatment? We did have a retailer section this year. I, I don't think the message got out as well as it could have. We mm -hmm. could have done a better job saying before they got there to, on their uh, confirmation for the mm -hmm. registration confirmation, could have said, don't forget we have a lounge for you. So that's something we will try to improve on next year. And then we just launched uh, matchmaking stations and <laughs> When we did them the first time, it said matchmaking. And the fact that I had to go back and put business matchmaking is I had my <gasps> cute little girl sitting there and guys are like, are you going to hook me up? And I was like, yeah. no, this is not match.com. But that's what they thought. Anyways, so we launched match matchmaking stations. And the great thing is because the people that are on the phone or on the road being in front of them, they're the people at that desk. So people walk right. up and recognize their name and are like, oh, Mary or Jane or whatever. And then they start the conversation. Um, and they're, they're equipped to, to be able to, oh, I'm looking for, you know, blue socks or whatever and they can walk them through you know where to go and it also gives us a way to connect but they're in really prominent locations it is you know they're front and center at the show so we're catching them right they walk in the door we found that in the lobby might not always be the best spot because that's the bathroom questions but when you know you've got them kind of in that once they get on the floor and they've you know, got through all the bathroom, I've got my directory and everything. Um, and we've also encouraged them to once this team, if they're out on the road or on a phone call, you know, we use their, you know, you got your personal, here's my direct line, right. whatever. So, and then they tell them, come see me, I'll be at the matchmaking right. desk. And then we have those highlighted on the show floor and tell people like, come see me. And then, you know, once you start to make that, you've taken somebody out to dinner or you've been in their store, they're like, oh, I gotta say hi to Jocelyn right. or I gotta say hi to Nadine or whatever. So they'll, they'll make an effort to come by and see you. Yeah. We do, we do have formal programs mm -hmm. at a lot of our events where we do this, where we, um, well, we give them a special phone number to call if they need help with making travel reservations or, or what have you. So they sort of do have their concierge. Mm -hmm. um, some of the direct mail pieces that go to these VIP programs, we, we will put somebody's business card. We'll attach that if you need it. And it says if you need anything in advance or on site, please call. We'll have a lounge. Sometimes we do sponsored um, goodie bags where they may have, you know, waters and a power bar and chapstick and mm -hmm. a few other things that are given to them courtesy of a sponsor or, or several sponsors. And I mean, um, you know, a few touches. Didn't you guys used to do transportation for people, right, from like one venue to another when you had multiple venues? That, 
yeah. one of your shows. Yeah. So I know a lot of people do that, transportation from the airport. And, right. um, you know, depending on the value of the buyer, kind of add in special touches. So what about you in terms of measuring success? Can, can what kinds of things do you do to justify the ROI and, and yeah, track and we're on the infancy with, with the actual met metrics. Uh -huh. You know, we can we do know our show went the attendance went up nine percent the first year we had the program and seventeen the second. But go ahead and I, take I, all the credit. And I want to say I'm yeah. going to Shelly and I, my colleague and I, are going to take mm -hmm. all of the credit for that. But um, realistically, I know it came from other places as well. <laughs> But, but now that we, we are using the um, data tracking, mm -hmm. who we talked to, what did we talk about, we can start pairing that with our registration numbers moving forward. Mm -hmm. We just haven't really done it yet. How expensive is it to send a team out to collect data face to face? How do you sell this internally at your company? I don't know that this is for everyone or every show. I think sometimes when there are buyers that represent a significant portion of the buying power that you know your exhibitors need to see in order to be successful and therefore there are those hard ROI metrics that it really does make sense mm -hmm. justifying, um, you know, you can justify the expenses. And then as Shauna was saying, on the other end of the spectrum, when you need, when you, you know, if you're trying to build your brand in a certain way or launch mm -hmm. a new event and there are critical people that you need at that show to be legitimate. Um, you know, it, it makes sense in that way too. I'm not sure that it makes sense for, for everyone. And I don't know that being on the road always makes sense either. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of what we do is, is just phone. phone calls mm -hmm. and even super personalized emails too, where we look up things about the buyer and we say, oh, congratulations, I see you just got a promotion because we searched it online and mm -hmm. we can write in a really customized way that gets people to take notice and, and write us back. So I don't know that it always has to be on the road. It's great if you can do it, but if you can't, there are some other ways to still be personal. I think um, to that point, at, at, to me, that's a great way to start if you're trying to sell it, because you don't have to sell it all at mm -hmm. once. You can start with, you know, I feel like we have this population that would be great influencers. And if you started with something small, like three major cities, and you did influencer breakfast with a small group there, and tracked how that came through for you. And sometimes, mm -hmm. especially at the beginning, it is a long-term sale. So we do a lot of follow-up. You have a lot of conversation at the beginning. You go back to them and say, hey, that conversation we had where you told me that you were really needing X, I just wanted to let you know. We've really incorporated that into the event. I hope you'll come check it out, you know, to really build that relationship. And when you can prove that this one one to one relationship is driving an increase here or we're seeing this this change that we want I think it can give you sort of the fuel you need to say now if I put a team on the ground and had them out there we could do that so much more and I will say with with ours we do uh, a, a lot of it's done at, at um, Emerald now over the phone we don't spend as much money as uh, we had at mm -hmm. magic for for travel um, but what we are able to see and try, like I said tying it back to the database we do a ton of telemarketing too um, you, we're, we're all knowing like if we're doing all the things if we're social media if you know if it's content marketing if we're doing the emails we're, we're doing the direct mail and all those things you know this is you know the, the kind of last component because if it's the face-to-face -face or the phone calls and we can tell like I know what my uh, rate of response is and my rate of return is on telemarketing and I also know the verification rate is higher when one of my team talks to them it's a longer conversation mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times especially if it's a it's a large buyer or a new buyer it takes longer and a telemarketer can't do that but I use telemarketing extensively on people that you know it's been a couple years since they've come we, we need to I, I, I can tell you right now I'm definitely finding you know my open rates are 20 25 percent on emails Good, yeah, I know, but when 80%, it freaks me, 80% are not getting it. So, you know, I put in the phone and call them, and I spend $50,000 on one telemarketing campaign. So, but, but I can tell all the way through. Like, I know, you know, my telemarketing people are getting more people registered, so I have to take the time and work with them to know that the goal is not to get them to register. The goal is to get them to show up. Thanks for watching this session on developing an attendee relations program that nets real results. This is IAEE TV, produced by CNTV. Thank you.